to the stage right now. Keepers of the faith, how about it? Well, search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. Please search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. Oh, well, now turn the lights from the heaven on to my soul. Well, if you find anything that shouldn't be, take it out and strengthen me. I want to live right. I want to be safe. I want to be whole. Shoot when I'm wrong. You know. Shoot when I'm wrong. You know where I go, oh, you know where I belong. Lord, you know all I do, and you know my secrets too. So search me, touch me, cleanse me, Lord. Then search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. Well, well, now turn the lights from the heaven on my soul. Will it find anything that shouldn't be?
Thank you, keepers of the faith. You all right? All right? I'd like to read just a couple of verses from Psalm chapter 4. It says, tremble from fear, but do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart. More than when their grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, do make me to dwell in safety. Let's bow. Father, we thank you for the peace, the peace that we felt in that last song, the peace that we feel as we read those words written in Psalm 4. We thank you for the peace that we feel when we know that the Holy Spirit is residing in our hearts. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here who cannot lie down, in peace and in safety, that they would come running to you soon, right away. They would not wait because we know that our hope is not in anything or anyone else. It is in you alone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Father, it is so good to be here in this place that you have filled with a glimpse of your glory, Lord, that you have poured out your spirit in us, Lord, that we might know you, the living God. Lord, truly, it is a privilege beyond our words that we are here this morning enjoying you. And God, thank you that you are the God who reveals yourself to us and has shown us your heart. And Lord, that this morning we stand in hope, the hope of eternal life with you, the hope of knowing you in a greater and greater way throughout eternity. Lord, we desire to lift up our voices with one voice and give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you so deserve. We praise you today in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's wonderful to be in God's house and uh, Children's Church. If you're uh, going to that, you are dismissed. I see them leaving, so I want to make mention of that. It is good to be in God's house. It's good to have Brother Gordon back. Amen. Amen. And uh, we missed him and glad that God blessed him with a good and safe trip. And uh, we also want to just a special welcome to Keepers of the Faith. Thank you for being here with us. Amen. You all are a blessing to so many, and uh, that's just evidence of God's grace ministering through you, and we are the recipients of God's grace in you, and we just want to say thank you for opening yourselves up and uh, allowing God to use you and take you places, probably not always easy, but... uh, we are just so glad that you're here today, and, and uh, may the Lord bless you and your ministry. I do want to just especially welcome uh, any guests that we have here today also, and, and uh, there's a little connection card in the bulletin. We'd love for you to fill that out and just drop that in the back connection box if you get a chance on your way out of the sanctuary. Also, uh, before we get going here, wanted to mention that this is our uh, time that we celebrate birthdays, and so be sure to get a piece of cake uh, on your way out, Uh, especially if you were born in February. We want to just give God praise for your life and uh, recognize you and uh, and just say thank you, God, for for creating you. Amen. I also want to just say it's been a busy week for our family, and I know uh, many of you know that we've had a surgery in our family, so we just thank you for your prayers uh, in, in that regard, and, and uh, Venice and Charity made it home Thursday, so that's always good um, to have the family back together again, so thank you, thank you for your prayers. I want to talk today about the cost of fellowship, and, and you know, you can see there in front of you the, the cross, the crosses, and in particular, obviously, the cross of Christ depicted, and, and uh, we know that there's been a great cost paid for, for our fellowship, right? That God has paid the price in allowing his son to die for our sins in our place. And through that work of Christ, through his atoning work, we have become family, right? That God is redeeming from every tribe, from every trung, from every people, from every language. God is redeeming and bringing together a people that are family, right? That are family. And one thing is, is that we don't want to just take it for granted, do we? We want to realize that what we are part of here as a local body and globally as the body of Christ and eternally uh, is something to be treasured, amen? Because the greatest price was paid. The greatest price. And it shows us the heart of God that God's heart is, is that w- the way he sees us is that we are of infinite value, right? Right? We are of infinite value, that you can't put a value on us. That's how God has demonstrated his love for us. I want to begin in Matthew 16. It's a familiar passage to us. He said to them, verse 15, it'll be in front of you. If you have your Bibles, I'd welcome you to just open your Bible up and and take a look. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, of course, never one to shy away. He answered and he said, you are the Christ or the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I love that verse. I mean, that's got to be one of our favorite verses in all of scripture. Jesus declaration of what he's going to do, right? I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The promise of Christ to his people, that he will raise us again from the dead. There's a lot that could be said about that first part of verse 18, um, where he says, I say to you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, right? There, that's been, uh, much has been said about that verse. If, if you're uh, at all aware of church history and, and kind of read any commentaries on that verse, a lot has been said 
about that verse, and I really don't want to uh, spend a whole lot of time on it, but it's, it's too hard to resist not saying a little bit of something for just a couple minutes. So I want to just take a moment that some have used this phrase that, that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church to, to kind of uh, justify what I would call a top-down Christianity, right? Where it says you don't read and understand the scripture through the Holy Spirit, but rather uh, we are the ones who tell you, right? An elite uh, person or group or one person tells you what it means and, and then you go and do it. But thank God that each of us has a connection with Almighty God through His Spirit. Amen? Each of us has that connection. We are all called to know God, right? That's part of the New Covenant, that God, has, that God says, they will all know me, right? That's what He said. They will all know me. And so we're not, uh, we're not here, we wouldn't want to use this verse to justify a top-down Christianity that says that the interpretation only comes from one or from a very select few because God is in the business of revealing truth to each of us through his spirit and it's so important that we grab a hold of that and lay a hold of that that God is desiring that we seek him that we know him right that we hear from him that we hear from him and it is a, a, a good point that's been noticed that Jesus did not say to Peter uh, or he said to Peter on this rock he did not say on you Peter and if you read uh, a little bit of the accounts of Peter, you realize that I, I think Peter would say that, you know, he, didn't, he wouldn't want to be the one that would, the whole church was built upon, right? I mean, Peter had some problems, right? And um, we even see it uh, later on in his ministry that, that he got caught up in some errors. I don't think Peter would want to be the, the one upon whom the whole church was built because he recognized that there was only one chief cornerstone. There was only one that could handle it, and that was Jesus Christ. The good news is that we know what the rock is that Jesus refers to by the context. And, of course, when we, when we study the scriptures, we want to be really careful that we put it into context, right? Um, there's a lot of errors that have been made by pulling out one scripture, and we don't want to make that error, and, and we want to put it into context. The rock that Jesus is referring to that he's saying he's going to build his church upon is, is evidenced, is seen in the confession of faith that Peter made when he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living good, the son of the living God. The rock upon which Christ builds his church is the revelation that is received within the heart. And by that, I mean yielded to, not just an intellectual knowledge, not just a, 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 some facts that we have, but a revelation that is yielded to in the heart of who Jesus is and his work. That's the, the rock upon which Christ was going to build his church. And with Peter, we see that he made this confession of faith. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, the word tells us that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? There's a connection, right? The saved are the, the church. There's a connection between our confession, our calling out to the Lord Jesus Christ, and being translated and put into the church. Of course, it is a work of the Spirit, amen? The verse that we left out there between those two, verse uh, 17... It said, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And there's another scripture in Corinthians that says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so this work that this work of confession that comes about within us, that, that Jesus Christ uses to build his church as we, as we put our faith, as we receive who he is and his work about what he said. This work is a work of the spirit within us. And it's a challenge to us, isn't it, that as Christians, as we go out and we witness that we always bathe it in prayer, right? Because we know that, that God has to pour out his Holy Spirit upon that person to open their heart, to open their heart that they might receive and see who Jesus is, that he is the son of God, that he's the Messiah, that he's the savior of the world, that he is the one 
who bore our sins and died in our place and bore the consequence of man's sin on the cross. And so bathe your witnessing in prayer, right? That's really, I think, a, a, a point that we can gain from realizing that it is the work of the Spirit. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And of course, the church that Jesus was talking about was the community of the saved, right? All who will inherit eternal life. That's the church. The church is the community of the saved, those who will inherit eternal life, those who are delivered from sin, right? From its consequence, from its curse, ultimately from its presence. The church Jesus is talking about is the general assembly that, that is registered in heaven. And we can say this, all those who have repented of their sins, right? Who have turned to God and trusted Christ. That's the church that Jesus is talking about. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Amen. Of course, Hades stands in opposition to what Christ is doing, right? Right? It is the place of the dead, or it is the grave. It is the direct opposite of life. It is the place where every soul would go and stay apart from Christ's intervention, his church building project. That's why Jesus takes Hades square on right here. Because if he's going to talk about building his church, he's going to have to address the problem of Hades, of hell, the dead. He knows what stands in the way to this incredible claim that he's going to build his church and the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. He knows that something incredible stands in the way of his claim that he has to address. And it's no wonder, right, that church is important. If you do wonder whether church is important, wonder no more, right? Because it is only as important as where we will spend eternity or how we will spend eternity, dead or alive. That's what the church, uh, that's the importance of the church. Will we be dead for all of eternity or will we live with God? Jesus says, I am going to build my church and even the gates of Hades will not stand in my way. That's quite a claim, isn't it? That's quite a claim by the Messiah. I am going to build my church, Jesus says. I am going to build a community of those who possess eternal life and Hades will not prevail. Rather, Jesus says, I will prevail against it. And so really what we can say is that Jesus is making a promise, right, to everyone who will trust him. Jesus is making a promise to us in that verse. To everyone who will stand upon that rock, who will receive that confession of who he is, his work and his person, who will receive in their heart the revelation of who he is and not deny it. Many have denied it. John wrote and he said that if you deny that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, you make God a liar because this is the testimony that God has given about his son, that he is his son, Jesus the Christ. Jesus is promising to us that even though you die, the grave will not hold you. He will raise you from the dead. I'm glad he's building his church. I like life. I don't want my soul to remain in the grave. And I want to be with God. The psalmist says, in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand, our pleasures forevermore. I'm, I'm glad Jesus took on the church building project. And he's saving souls and he's building his church. Gates are interesting things, are they not? They're somewhat of a lost concept in our modern era. But of course, ancient cities, they, they lived and died by their gates in a sense. 
They were surrounded by walls and they had a few access points. Of course, gates are often used to keep people out, but sometimes they're used to keep people in, right? Remember the Berlin Wall and uh, how President Reagan famously said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Imagine living in a country that, that walled you in to keep you as part of their people, right? It was so good they had to keep you there by force. You always have to wonder when the government forces something on you, right? Just exactly how good it is for you. The gates of Hades operates, are operated in the same way of, of keeping people in, not escaping. Gates, of course, are controlled by, by authorities. Satan was given dominion over the dead in Hades. And no one was ever going to leave. We read this in Hebrews 2.14. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, of course it's speaking of Christ, that through death, his death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. That's an interesting statement, that Satan had the power of death. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot that we could consider, a lot that could be said. But I think it's talking about because the devil had instigated and had caused and promoted sin in the world, he was the key or he was the catalyst to death, right? We could, I think we could say that. He was the key to why death came into the world because he was the instigator of sin. And so in this sense, death became Satan's achievement. Death was his ultimate act in hurting a loving God because he, he was killing through his instigation and, and promotion of sin, God's people. And thus we can say that Hades became his lair, his kingdom. And death, in a sense, as we read it in this verse, was his power. He had power, the power of death. Can you imagine death being your kingdom? What kind of a person do you have to be, right? What kind of a being do you have to be where where when you talk about your kingdom and your dominion, you have to refer to that which is dead. Now, I know many of you are gardeners, and, and uh, you know, imagine looking at your garden, and it's completely dead, right? And being proud of that, that that's what your accomplishment was. And yet, that's somehow the way Satan ticks. That he, that's, his, that's his golden achievement. But the good news is that Christ destroyed him. Christ destroyed him. Christ has prevailed. Satan's kingdom has been brought to nothing because his power has been annulled. His greatest achievement has been taken from him. His lair spoiled. And so Christ says in Revelation and Colossians, he says in Revelation, he says, I am he who lives and who was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. And I love this verse in Colossians 2. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Of course, we're referring to the resurrection of Christ, raised by God. This church of Christ that he's built, this place, right, of fellowship, of communion, of friendship, of family, with, with each other and with God, this place of worship, this place of worship, we so appreciate it, right? Because the church came at great cost to Christ. It wasn't just a mere function of the power of Christ that blew the doors off of Hades, right? Right? He didn't just say, fall, gates of hell, although he could have. Jesus could have settled it that way. But there was a reason behind why people were, why people behind, uh, were, there was a reason behind why people were there. And that reason needed to be addressed. It wasn't just a mere function of the power of the Almighty that blew the gates off of hell. 
There was a reason behind why people were there, and we know the reason, right, without preaching another sermon on it. Sin and guilt and consequence and judgment. We know the reason why people were there and are there. The problem of sin needed to be dealt with since God is righteous. He's holy. He's just. And so it became a matter of justice. And we know the story that Christ gave his life for that cause, bearing the consequence of sin, the ultimate consequence being death. He gave his life for that cause. As the scriptures tell us that the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And of course, when we think about the cross, it is such a revelation of the character of God, isn't it? That God is both just and loving. Just, not wanting just to sweep sin and injustice. I mean, we turn on the news, right? And we see the stories of injustice in the world and we want, their, we want the account to be straightened out, right? We don't want to just sweep it under the carpet. Well, God is just, God is holy, God is righteous. And in the cross, we see God's righteousness on display in that he doesn't let sin go unpunished, but we let we also see his love on display in coming in the person of his son and suffering. And so, yes, there was a great cost paid for the church. Jesus said, as he talked to the disciples, he said, I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail. And they didn't, but it cost him his life. And my prayer is, God, help us to see it. Help us to see the value and the worth of what you have done because of the price that was paid. Let's not miss, right, the the value, the infinite value of the one who sits next to you, right? Don't miss it. Search your hearts. Ask yourself, what your spiritual brethren in the faith is worth to you? What's their priority? Every one of us being blood-bought, right? Every one of us being loved with a perfect love, demonstrated in the coming of the Lord, suffering for us, going to the cross. Every one of us being blood-bought by him. And it's true that down through the ages, God has done an amazing thing in that he always brings a diverse group of people together, right? Isn't it true that anyone can become my spiritual brother or sister in the Lord? From every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation, from every people, anyone can become my brother in the Lord or sister in the Lord. God has done an amazing thing in this church and in the church in the world, all that he has redeemed. And we have the privilege, right, of loving one another and serving one another. I love the verse in John 13. It says, by this all will know that you are my disciples. How? By your love one for another. And isn't it true that God is still still showing us the amazing uh, mystery that Paul talked about of bringing different people together to form one body in Christ. Amen. We are all brought together. We are all placed before the Father as righteous and holy by the broken body and shed blood of the Messiah. And so today, I, I want to close with this verse in Ephesians 3.21. It says, To him be the glory to God in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And let, let this church, let the church of Christ, let the church that God has redeemed, let the church that Christ has shed his blood for and died be the citadel of praise, Right? the citadel of worship, proclaiming who he is, proclaiming his work and his person. Because that's what this verse is saying. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Let us be a citadel of praise, a place where worship is what we are about. 
what we're doing, and we see the immense, the infinite value of every person that sits next to us. Let the church be held in high esteem because Christ, right, he's blown the doors off of Hades for us, and I praise him for it. Worship team, would you come forward? Will you stand with us? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest Amen. We're going to pray. Uh, Christ said that he would build his church, and he's building his church on that confession of faith of who he is, that he's the Christ, and his work, and he's the Son of the living God. And if you've never made that confession today, I invite you to do it today, to call out to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I believe that you are my Savior, that I need a Savior, that I'm a sinner stained with the mistakes that I've made, and my nature that is so often bent against you and your ways. And I need a Savior, and his name is Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the Christ. And he went to the cross, and he paid that debt, and I believe that he is your son, and I believe that he's been declared to be your son from the resurrection from the dead. If you've made that confession and you believe it in your heart, you are part of the church that Jesus Christ is building. You are a living stone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are at work to save. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the hope that we have of life eternal in your Son. We thank you, Lord, that you raised him from the dead. He appeared. He walked this earth for 40 days. He appeared to over 500 at once. Lord, the men that he appeared to, those men went and, and women went and turned the world upside down. And, Lord, you're still appearing to people. 
Lord, you're still making yourself known. You're still turning the world upside down. And God, today we thank you that you have not stopped building your church. And we thank you that we are living stones, a temple, Lord, that you indwell, that you fill. Lord, that we might know you, that you might know us, that there might be communion and fellowship. Lord, we praise you today. We pray, Lord, for every heart that that is here, God, my heart, every heart. Lord, that we would just see you in a little clearer way. We praise you today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.